Okay, you guys, we're going to be talking about eutrophication and water quality chemistry today. Um, but before I dig into the lecture stuff, I have a quick problem for you to solve and then to turn it in for a credit, no credit assignment this week due on Friday. So solve the following problem to the best of your ability on paper. Do it the way that we've been doing in class, you know, with, uh, you know, put a box around uh, the units you want in the end, what you're being asked, what your guesstimate is, the railroad track formula and all that stuff. Anyway, do it on paper, take a photo of it, insert it into a Word document, or do it some other way and make a Word or a PDF. Um, just make sure it's legible and upload uh, to a credit, no credit assignment um, number three by Friday at five o'clock, okay? Uh, Print your name neatly at the top, I guess. You don't have to since I'll know it's you, but you can if you want to. All right, follow all the problems, uh, the rules of problem solving in this class, the railroad track formula, scientific notation, and sig figs. The scientific notation sig figs are expectations I really want you to get this semester, so I'm really gonna repeat that throughout the semester on you. Okay, um, and here's the problem. Try to calculate the amount of water drunk by our entire 76 person class in one year in terms of the volume of an average sized bedroom. <laughs> okay, I'll just give you some hints. How big is an average sized bedroom? I don't know, just guess and make some measurements. By the way, your um, pace, you know, one pace for you is going to be two to three feet so you might use that you maybe you know your height and you can use that as a guess for the volume of an average size bedroom don't worry nobody's going no two people are going to get the same exact answer but probably we should all get the answer within a power of 10. okay uh do that um do i say oh yeah um feel free to work with others but try to work on the problem on your own that's the whole point of you doing these assignments or me having you doing these assignments is to help you get used to doing these assignments so you get better at it okay all right good luck um that's all well all right so back to the uh, lecture at hand um i'm going to start off with a value judgment i say that clean water is good it's a valuable thing in and of itself uh, well I'm gonna say you know when someone makes a value judgment particularly in the natural resources it's a good idea to try to explain what are the values um, be explicit about them so I've done that and I would say one reason that I think water is good is for aesthetics I think it's beautiful um, here's a picture of me and some friends in some high um, Sierra Lake, and it's beautiful. How can you not say it's beautiful? It just is, and so to take something beautiful and turn it to something polluted is to destroy beauty. That can't be good. Uh, although there might be com competing values. It might be better that we don't die uh, and make something ugly as opposed to we all die and we leave something good, I suppose. But I'm just saying. One reason I think water is good is because of aesthetics. All right, uh, here's just, I can't help it. Here's the Smith River. It's one of, I think, the most beautiful rivers I have ever seen in all my travels. And it's in our backyard here. I hope someday you get to go to the Smith River, especially around uh, uh, upstream from Jedediah Smith um, and maybe like near Gasky or above Gasky, below Gasky. G-A-S-Q-U-E-T on Highway 199. That's a great place to go swimming. Uh, also, clean water is good because clean water hosts a high level of biodiversity. Um, lots of different species thrive in clean water. And when you pollute it and you make it not clean, they tend to die off. In fact, we've, especially on the east coast of North America, we've lost a lot of species of Weird things you might not really care much about, um, bivalves, uh, which are clams and mussels and that kind of thing. But there was a ton of bivalve diversity in eastern North America. A lot of it has been wiped out or threatened by water pollution. Uh, but not just bivalves, other things as well, like Chinook salmon, um, coho salmon, different kinds of salmon, different populations of salmon. Clean water is good because of its biodiversity. Um, and of course, you know, many people focus only on human health. So I'll just shout out to that. Um, human, 
uh, um, use of water. <laughs> what do you think when you see this kid lapping up water? Are you thinking, oh my gosh, he's going to get Giardia and die or cholera or dysentery or any of the other waterborne diseases? Maybe you are because you have grown up in a world where a lot of the world's water sources have been contaminated with uh, human-borne diseases, uh, human-borne sewage, sewage-borne diseases. And it is not safe to drink that water. I would say that's bad. Um, I've been to a lot of places where you can drink the water straight from the ground. And that's how humans have always drunk the water until we started polluting it in the last couple hundred years. Uh, because of our numbers and our pollution and so forth. So, uh, darn it, that, isn't that a great loss? Okay, I'm gonna say that's bad. Uh, so, what is it that humans do that pollutes water? I've got a picture here of a Walmart Supercenter, and it's here to uh, symbolize that we uh, buy stuff, we use things, and those things come from someplace that typically we don't know where they come from. And in the making of those products, there is pollution that often is released into the waterways. So I call that industrial pollution. And here's a picture that symbolizes industrial pollution. Actually, I don't really know anything about this picture. I think I stole it from the internet. Um, and I don't know where these pipes are coming from. I don't know where in the world this is, but it symbolizes for us industrial water pollution. Industries use water. They often contaminate it with all kinds of things. Um, and then they discharge that water somehow. They may treat it, they may not. That depends on regulation, but nevertheless, industry is a source of water pollution. What else is a source of water pollution? Well, let's call it municipal water pollution, water pollution by cities. Here's the city of Arcata. Thank you, Google Earth. Um, and you know what goes on in Arcata. There's a lot of residences. There's a lot of households in Arcata. And every time we turn the water on, there's a drain that collects the water. Um, and that, so every household has a drain going down um, into the municipal sewage treatment system. Um, here's the city, uh, here's the Humboldt State University. We have laboratories, uh, we have dorms, we have offices, we have all kinds of use of water. There's a fisheries place and that water's got to go somewhere. There's also some industry here. So these categories, industrial, municipal, they're overlapping. Up here on the left is a big bulb farm. They use a lot of water. Um, I don't know if they discharge any of it or if they have ponds, I don't know. But anyway, cities are a source of water pollution. You can see down below um, the humble, uh, I'm sorry, the city of Arcata's um, Arcata Marsh. And I'll say more about it later, I think, but it's just a really, in, oh, I know, there's a link to it on our Canvas page. And I hope you go to that link and read about the city of Arcata's um, uh, wetlands treatment of sewage and how they have turned what could be a source of environmental contamination into basically a natural resource. Uh, a lot of the green stuff you see in this area here is basically mm, fertilized wetlands that is growing an abundant amount of plants which are used by migratory waterfowl as well as fish that use the area. Uh, and uh, basically it's become a really good resource for, for instance, any bird that are migrating north or south in fall or spring or spring and fall. Uh, anyway, um, check it out. Uh, the city of Arcata does things differently from other cities. So municipal water pollution is the second category. The first was industrial. And the third that I'm going to talk about is agricultural water pollution. Here's a picture of, I just call this industrial agriculture. This is not a family farm that's, uh, you know, on less than 100 acres. This is a corporate agriculture. And uh, capitalism in the United States has resulted in enormous uh, commercial farms, corporate farms, not owned by individuals. And there's a huge investment, not only in um, machinery, but also in fertilizers and herbicides. And so this land here, and you can just look at a map of the United States and look at the center of the United States, the Great Plains um, and the prairies, all of that land has been converted from a natural grassland into this form of agriculture. And um, the thing is that a certain amount of the fertilizers applied to these farmlands uh, ends up running off. It's not what the farmers want because that's a waste to them, but inevitably it happens. 
Uh, also, this can uh, not come, this is probably wheat being f farmed here, but also from um, cattle feedlots and pig farms, chicken farms. It, industrial agriculture leads to water pollution, as I will describe in this lecture. Uh, okay, so water pollution is widespread, and since it is widespread and generally accepted as an important environmental problem, because the values I espoused earlier are shared by many, um, you need to get some domain knowledge about it. If you remember domain knowledge I mentioned in the critical thinking lecture, is just ba background knowledge in something that enables you to critically, mm, critically, critically think about it. So in this class, I thought that this is a good subject to address, to uh, provide some domain knowledge. It's got many environmental, uh, environmental science, environmental studies, environmental issue relevance. And so I thought some domain knowledge would be good for all of us. And it's sort of an example of how you can use domain knowledge and critical thinking. And also um, we'll be using it as an, uh, a way to uh, learn how to use Excel later on. Also, it was in, back in the days of face-to-face -face education, we would actually go out and learn some methods for sampling water. Okay, um, so we're gonna focus on the basics of water chemistry here and its measurement. Later in this course, we will go um, away from water chemistry and talk about benthic macroinvertebrates, the organisms that live in water, as a proxy for measuring water chemistry. And I'll talk more about that later on in this lecture, just water chemistry. Okay, let's start with this. Much water pollution is associated with chemical macro with chemical macronutrients. So now I gotta define what this is. First of all, this word nutrient, be careful of that word because nutrients to different people mean different things. So if I go grocery shopping and I'm with a health expert and I talk about nutrients, they might talk about amino acids and proteins and oils and stuff like that. And that is not the definition of nutrients or nutrition that I'm talking about here. Chemical macronutrients, it turns out, let's see, what do I say here? Ah. Uh, these are elements, carbon, hydrogen. See if you know what the other ones are. Okay, I'll tell you. You know, right? You don't? Doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. These are chemical elements. I hope you understand chemically what that means, and you can differentiate between a chemical and a molecule. Okay, these are not molecules. These are the building blocks of molecules. There's only, a, oh gosh, I forgot, 120, 130 um, uh, elements, uh, natural elements in the universe. And it turns out of all those hundred and whatever elements, uh, all living organisms are made up almost entirely of just these. There are some micronutrients. Okay, zinc is probably one, mm, uh, uh, iron, does, iron does not show up on here. They're super important, but they don't form the bulk of living organisms. So the bulk, I'm a living organism. The bulk of this tissue here is made of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. So, and it turns out that some of these can, in, in excess, can cause water pollution. And that's why we need to talk about chemical nutrients because we're trying to understand water pollution. Okay, so now I have to uh, step back a bit away from water pollution because you can't understand um, water pollution by chemical macronutrients unless you understand some really important ecology. And I have summarized a whole lot of ecology in what I call the equation of life on Earth, which I might abbreviate T-E-O-L-E, -E, something like that. The equation of life on Earth. I get very excited about it because um, it, takes so much, it basic, basically takes the whole biological world, and even more than that, the Earth itself, and summarizes it in one tidy equation that explains so much. So I've developed this myself, the equation of life on Earth is a Murphy uh, invention, and I'm gonna share it with you, and I'm actually gonna ask you to learn it um, forward and backward. So let's, let's get to it. Oh man, okay, <laughs> I just revealed it all. I'll get to it. it I'm gonna start this way. Uh, so uh, here's the equation of life on Earth. It starts with two crisscrossing arrows. 
In chemistry, this means it's a reversible reaction. That means you can have a bunch of, um, uh, let's see, reactants on one side, some mixture that you put in a bowl, and something magic happens to it, a reaction occurs, and you get some products. And, and, but the products can also revert to the reactants. It goes back and forth. So this is cool. This is super important because it means over time on Earth, these things cycle. And cycle and recycling in nature is huge. Okay, so I'm going to start. I want to make sure you understand the two arrows are reversible. And we have names in the equation of life on Earth for each of these arrows, the one that goes this way and the one that goes that way. And I'll, I'll reveal that shortly. Uh, in addition to some things recycling, there's actually something that goes in and drives the reaction and then something that comes out when the reaction reverses. So uh, while the two, these two arrows uh, symbolize a cycling, the other two arrows going up and down symbolize something going through and driving these equations. Uh, that'll be more, make more sense shortly. All right, here's what happens, is water and carbon dioxide, H2O, make sure you know all of these molecules, water and carbon dioxide can turn into a biomass and oxygen gas. So that's cool for a couple of reasons. First of all, this whole thing here is photosynthesis. Maybe you studied photosynthesis to death and it got, you got, it got ruined for you, but it shouldn't. It's, if you boil it down, this is what photosynthesis is. Plants can take water and carbon dioxide, water from the ground, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and magically, through the process of photosynthesis, create biomass. What do they create? Oh, sugars and stuff like that. But ultimately, biomass. Um, and a waste product, which is oxygen gas. So oxygen gas floats off into the atmosphere. Super important, right? And you do that. Plants give off oxygen through photosynthesis. So that's that. But the reverse can happen as well. Biomass and oxygen can combine and something happens and they give off um, water and CO2. So these things go back and forth. Um, the forward reaction I said was photosynthesis. The reverse reaction, I want you to know this, aerobic respiration. Actually, anaerobic respiration is slightly different, does the same thing, but we'll just call this aerobic respiration because aerobic respiration requires O2. Anaerobic respiration does not. But we're focused on aerobic respiration. Great, you're an aerobic respirator, I'm an aerobic respirator, Everything you see out there is in a, every living thing that you can see is an aerobic respirator. Um, in the dark black mucks, uh, in marshes and deep in soil, there's some anaerobic respiration. You know it because it stinks real bad. We're just going to skip over that part and focus on aerobic respiration. So I need biomass. I'm going to get some food. It's biomass. Here's some in a jar. I'm going to drink that. It's got complex stuff in it. Um, I'm going to breathe to get oxygen and my cells magically, I don't know how they do it through aerobic respiration, um, they give off, I'm exhaling CO2 and I'm also exhaling uh, water, it's water vapor. Okay, so the forward reaction is photosynthesis, the reverse re reaction is aerobic respiration. And then something comes through and something comes out, I think I've got that, yeah. so. That uh, light comes in and drives photosynthesis. You knew that. And when we burn stuff in our cells, we give off some energy. So I'm warm because the process of burning the biomass and oxygen uh, is releasing energy as well. And that energy radiates out into the universe. So here's a really important concept of the equation of life on Earth is that anything in these on this line here cycles over billions of years, whereas um, the energy goes through. So energy comes in from the sun. <laughs> if it weren't for the sun, there would be no equation of life on Earth and there would be no life on Earth. And the, it comes in and it drives this reaction. All photosynthesis uh, relies on this almost all 
photosynthesis does rely on this light. Um, and then all living organisms ultimately give that energy off. And if it weren't for a, a continuous input of solar energy, we'd all be gone. So I um, wanted to come back to this slide here and show that um, if these are the chemical macronutrients, as I mentioned before, and you should memorize them. I want you to know them. And again, you should maybe, if you can't remember uh, too well, come up with a, a memory trick, uh, a sentence that starts with C, then H, then N, O. Charlie has no onions. Please send, for instance. But if you make it um, obscene, then you'll remember it better. Just a trick. Um, Anyway, let's take a look at the C up here. Here's C right here. So C uh, gets turned into, must go into biomass because it's not an oxygen, but it returns. And um, H uh, gets turned into biomass and O gets turned into oxygen gas. And maybe it's also in biomass, which it is. Um, so these things become these things and these things become these things. And so we have C, H, and O, three of the chemical macronutrients now described in their behavior on Earth. Uh, C, H, and O, that leaves N, P, S, calcium, and magnesium. And as you'll see shortly, I'm foreshadowing, we're going to focus in on N and P and kind of ignore sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. It turns out that N and P are super important in water pollution. Okay. This is a study slide. I'm not going to go over this, but I'm going to leave this for you. And that means I'm going to quiz you and test you on it later. So I will probably grab questions here and put answers like here as the result. So make sure you understand all this stuff. If you do, you have learned the equation of life on earth and I am happy. And I think it will be useful for you to look at the world that way. Okay. So anyway, um, at some point, pause this slide or look at the PDF and study this and make sure you know it. I'm going to be talking about right pointing arrows and left pointing arrows too uh, on those quizzes. So make sure you have the rightness and leftness um, understood as well. Okay. I just want to say a few more things, I guess, uh, about before I get into nitrogen and phosphorus. One is oxygen. Oxygen is super important in the process of eutrophication. Um, and it's a casualty of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. Uh, so, but in order to understand it, you have to understand that oxygen gas uh, is in the atmosphere, a very small amount, by the way, and we rely on it to live, as you know, uh, but it can also dissolve in water, just like sugar and salt dissolve in water. So gases in the atmosphere dissolve into water at even lower levels, there's a much less oxygen per unit volume of water than there is in the atmosphere. And um, that's important because there's a lot of aquatic organisms that are aerobic and they need that oxygen. So Chinook salmon, crayfish, uh, any, um, any organism that you can see needs oxygen in that water. And so uh, this, th there's some characteristics of water that has high oxygen and there's characteristics of water that have low oxygen and you need to know them as well as some terminology that goes with it. First of all, the abbreviation dissolved oxygen gas is abbreviated DO. So if you're talking water chemistry with someone, they're going to say DO. You should understand what that means. High DO is good. Low DO is bad. So, oh, high DO is one characteristic of what we call oligotrophic water. Please also know this term. Please also notice there's an H in it. It's not tropic, which is a completely different meaning. Oligotrophic. Trophic means eating or feeding. I don't know what oligo means. Probably high. So um, high DO is one characteristic of oligotrophic water. In general, we like oligotrophic water. We do not, do not like the opposite, which is eutrophic water. So uh, I hope you can see down at the bottom, eutrophic, E-U-T-R, uh, eutrophic. That means true eating. That's kind of weird. I don't know why it's called that. Anyway, if you think of beautiful water, you probably think of something like Lake Tahoe, which this is a picture of, and it's clear. You can see right through it. Why can you see right through it? Because there's not much growing in it. If it was full of growing things, it would be cloudy like the water on the right. Um, it tends to be cold, so clear, cold, high in oxygen. That's going to be oligotrophic water. 
usually, typically. There are plenty of exceptions, but that's about right. Now, eutrophic water is the opposite. It's going to have low, uh, I'm sorry, it's going to have low DO, and it's going to be cloudy because at least at the beginning, it has a lot of organisms living in it. They quickly die. Um, it's going to have some other characteristics as well that I'll list shortly. Oligotrophic, eutrophic, learn them, please, and their characteristics. Okay, so that covers H and O. I'm going to talk about the process of eutrophication and a little bit more on oligotrophic and eutrophic water later, but I um, wanted to talk about the other chemical macronutrients that we hadn't talked about yet. Um, carbon and water. Uh, I mentioned that, uh, uh, well, CO2 is a gas and oxygen is a gas. If oxygen dissolves in water, so does carbon dioxide. Uh, so what? Well, it, so CO2... Um, Hold on a sec. I'll just go with the lecture. What aquatic forms does C take? First, oh yeah, so, so carbon in the equation of life on Earth gets converted to biomass, and you find biomass in water. Algae, plankton, plants, animals, and detritus. Detritus is dead stuff. Um, so carbon in water can take the form of biomass. It can also take the form of dissolved CO2, which I started out by talking about. So oxygen dissolves in water, so can CO2. Okay, and then the third, oh, um, so just so you know, CO2 normally maintains equilibrium with the atmosphere. That is, um, there's this chemical relationship of, uh, of, uh, of equilibrium. It's a, it's a chemical concept. Uh, if you take a closed system with some gas in it and some water in it, after a while, some gas will dissolve in water and the, the concentration of the gas in the water will rise, but it won't gobble up all the gas out of the atmosphere. At, at some point, as much goes in as comes out. And so anyway, the, basically I just want to say gases uh, it maintain an equilibrium with the atmosphere. Um, let's see, and uh, now CO2, well, the concentration of CO2 in water uh, could be for two reasons. One is it's just an equilibrium in the atmosphere, but then um, aerobic organisms, if they do a lot of respiration, they can give off CO2, and that could also increase CO2, at least temporarily, in the water. I hope that makes sense. Um, the CO2, CO2 and its increasing concentration in the atmosphere and thus its increasing initial concentration in water is beginning to have a profound effect on marine systems via acidification. Maybe you've heard of ocean acidification. It's a consequence of anthropogenic pollution of the atmosphere by CO2. CO2 uh, levels are rising in the atmosphere. That means more CO2 is dissolving in the water. When it does that, there's a chemical reaction that increases acidity. And so I just wanted to mention a little bit about CO2 and its importance here before getting back to eutrophication. Also, a kind of a weird thing, uh, I'm not going to, I might ask a question, a uh, simple question on carbonate. Um, so things like limestone and, oh, I forgot the uh, magnesium containing dolomite, um, they, uh, they are a complex mineral that contains CO2. And they, are, they dissolve a little bit in water and they have a big effect on water chemistry. If you have carbonate in the water, um, that's called hardness. And it's involved in what's called buffering. These two things, I just don't have the time. I'd love to talk about it, but we don't have the time in the class to talk about it. I'm just throwing them out there because it's important to water chemistry. Um, and if you ever live in a place uh, where you get groundwater for your household, you're probably going to get carbonate in your water pipes. And so your household um, will have some problems occasionally with lime in your pipes. And you might have to use acid to get them out. And it's also going to taste different. Um, uh, but that's about all I'll say about it now. But anyway, that's where carbon can go in water into carbonate. Okay, so some chemical macronutrients are considered water pollutants, and we're gonna, so back up, what, do I, what are the chemical macronutrients? C, H, N, O, P, S, calcium, and magnesium. Some of them are considered water pollutants, not H, not O, 
uh, C, well, actually, C, if it's in carbon dioxide and causes acidification, you could consider that a pollutant. But the big two that we're going to concentrate are N and P, nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, and the reason these two are considered pollutants has to do with, with what's called the law of limiting factors. And I'm going to explain what the law of limiting factors is. And oh, notice it's underlined, so that means probably an exam question or two. Okay. So N and P are key limiting nutrients in both aquatic and terrestrial systems, in water and in soils. They're limiting nutrients. And what that means is that um, the um, plants, basically, things that do photosynthesis, there's, they can't grow as much as they like to because there's not enough N and P for them. Okay, If there's more N and P, they'll grow great. So if you just go to any old bit of soil somewhere and plant corn, it might not grow as well as if you planted corn and added some nitrogen and phosphorus in the form of manure or an inorganic fertilizer. So farmers figured this out not too long ago, and so they want to increase yield, so they fertilize and they get more plants. Um, the problem is when this NNP gets in water systems. Okay, so here is an oligotrophic lake I showed you before, and the growth in this is limited by the low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, okay? But if you add nitrogen and phosphorus to it, then nothing is limiting the growth of the algae that are there, okay? So oddly enough, the reason this water is so beautiful is because we're starving the algae, which is you know, good for us, maybe bad for the algae. Algae would love it if we polluted it with nitrogen and phosphorus. They would do this. Um, so this lake is eutrophic. Um, its growth is encouraged by high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. So uh, you might not want Lake Tahoe to become this. And so you would want to know, you would want to limit the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that gets in here. But before we talk about that, I just want to back up and make sure you understand the concept of limiting nutrients, li the law of limiting factors. Uh, we could also limit growth other ways by um, limiting water or limiting sunlight or overcrowding or all kinds of other things. So in ecosystems, many things can be a limiting factor. But typically in water, nitrogen and phosphorus are the limiting factor. And when you add them, you get an explosion of growth. Okay, and that is this, you have to understand all that background, the background of um, chemical macronutrients, the law of limiting factors, the equation of life on earth to understand eutrophication. So, you would think that in a lecture on eutrophication, I would spend a lot of time talking about eutrophication. Instead, I've spent a lot of time talking about the background of eutrophication, and now I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But the coming slide is a good study slide, so when I get done, with, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. You need to study it, though. Make sure you understand each step along the way. And if you have any questions, you don't understand any of the steps, and I don't explain it very well here, contact me or your lab instructor or Skylar. And, um, uh, your tutor or um, figure it out because it's important. Okay, we're going to start with oligotrophic and its characteristics are typically high, well always, high dissolved oxygen, low nutrient levels, light penetrates deeply because it's not cloudy. We think of it as a healthy aquatic system. This is a little bit biased towards um, the temperate zone. Um, it, when you get it to some other places, um, I've been to healthy aquatic systems where low oxygen is normal and high nutrient levels are normal and light doesn't penetrate deeply, but I'm just talking about our neck of the woods right now. So then there's the addition of nutrients. Um, how, do they, how do those nutrients get in there? Maybe naturally they just blow in on the dust or maybe they're runoff from agricultural systems or they come in through municipal uh, sewage treatment. Sewage is very high in nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, or maybe they come in through broken septic systems or maybe there's a, a cattle feedlot that is seeping nitrogen and phosphorus into the groundwater. Um, the nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, gets into water a variety of different ways. What happens next is you get an algal bloom. The water turns green with algae. The algae are very happy. They overpopulate. They go through exponential growth, which is a, a, a whole lecture we're going to get later on. Why do they grow so much? Because in, they're, they're no longer limited. Their nutrients were limiting them, but they're not anymore, so they explode. But 
Light does not penetrate. And then this is the thing that gets most people. They don't understand that there's a there's daytime and there's nighttime. And that plants like algae and you know green things, they don't only do photosynthesis, they also do respiration because they're alive, they need to eat the sugars they make. And so at nighttime, they eat, well, they eat those sugars all the time, but at nighttime, they're not doing photosynthesis. They're only eating those sugars and they're only doing aerobic respiration. So they use up all the oxygen. So there's nighttime respiration of algae. There's also elevated activity of detritivores. Those are things that eat dead stuff. So all these aerobic organisms are exploding too. And if you remember, aerobic respiration uses oxygen. So oxygen levels then plummet to near anaerobic levels, and then all the aerobes die. So initially you get an explosion of life followed by an explosion of death. And then all the aerobic organisms die and are replaced by anaerobic organisms those give off hydrogen sulfide gas and so they stink and your water turns green and it stinks and also fish are going to die and go belly up and it's just going to be ugly so that's the process of eutrophication it's a stepwise process you need to understand all of it so please study this slide carefully Here's a good example of eutrophic water, all right? Oh, and a pathetic attempt. These sprinklers here, they're trying to increase the oxygen levels with a few sprinklers here to try to, to address this problem. If you really wanted to address it, you'd want to get rid of the nitrogen and phosphorus, and then it would take care of itself. Um, this is this is a, probably a freshwater, I don't know what town this is in. Uh, uh, also, it's not just a landlocked thing. It also happens in the ocean. So eutrophication is also a marine phenomenon. Um, we used to call these red tides, but now I think we're supposed to not call them because they're not always red. Um, instead, we call them HABs, H-A-Bs, harmful algal blooms. And Siga terra disease, Google that, see what it is. Um, Demoic acid, uh, locally off the coast of, of Arcata, of Humboldt County, a lot of times domoic acids are elevated to the point where we cannot harvest Dungeness crabs and that industry is stopped until domoic levels um, go. Domoic acid is as a byproduct of certain organisms. I'm not sure which, but it, they definitely, I think, are um, uh, uh, increased by low oxygen levels, for instance, and what causes low oxygen levels, eutrophication, perhaps also, also warming. Okay, so Here's a modern sewage treatment plant. Uh, the United States government has realized that eutrophication is a social ill and we need to address it. And so we tax people and industries to pay for our polluted water to make it clean again. And I wish I had the time to explain to you how a sewage treatment plant works. I would normally teach it in an introductory environmental science class. I hope that's what you got. My bet a lot of you don't understand how a sewage treatment plant works, which I think is sad because it's a genius application of the understanding of uh, the equation of life on earth and chemical macronutrients. It's just fantastic that you can take poop water and get the nitrogen and phosphorus out of it and release that water and it's fine. It's high in oxygen, it's low in nitrogen and phosphorus, and also they've taken out uh, the diseases that come along with human sewage. Um, so it's pretty cool how this works. Now this one here is sort of a typical um, developed world sewage treatment plant, and it's expensive. It requires a lot of inputs of energy and equipment. Contrast that to the city of Arcata's approach, which is very um, low energy intensive and also needs very little machinery uh, and equipment. But the difference is the city of Arcata requires a big area of wetland. And so that's the trade-off between this kind of plant and the city of Arcata's plant. Um, okay. Um, very quickly, I wanted to mention a couple other qualities of water, pH and alkalinity. They're things we would have meant, we would have measured if this were a face-to-face -face class, we had a real lab. Basically, there's tools for measuring it. You go out and you stick your pH meter into the water and you read what it says. Um, alkalinity requires a chemical test. Um, they are important aspects of water quality that you would have measured. The pH, uh, uh, the pH chart, the pH system, 
Um, I'm not going to go over it. I think you should know it already. So I'm just going to throw it out here. Study it if you don't know it. Make sure you know a few things about it. Like if the numbers go big, what does it mean? It means it's getting more basic. If the numbers get smaller, it means more acidic. And also know uh, the source of the whole thing is really the relationship between hydrogen ions and um, hydroxyl ions. More H plus ions means more acidic. Um, and more OH ions uh, decrease means more basic. And make sure you know that this is a logarithmic scale, which means um, when you go from seven to eight, it's 10 times more as basic than from six to seven. So if you go from seven to nine, you're going up 100 times, from seven to 10, 1,000 times, seven to 11, 10,000 times. So this, uh, the, uh, the uh, intensity of the concentration of hydrogen and hydroxyl ions goes up a huge amount as you get to the extremes of the pH scale. Uh, just briefly, what's wrong with acidic water? What's wrong with basic water? Well, acidic water, um, one of the problems with it is it makes it, it makes um, anything that has a shell, such as a clam or an oyster or a crab or a coral, it makes, them, makes it harder for them to make that shell. Ocean acidification is increasing, and so I think in Humboldt Bay, they're actually able to measure this change in average oyster shell growth per year. At, with increasing acidity. So that threatens an industry. It also threatens biodiversity. Um, also, maybe you've heard of acid rain, not such a big problem here in California, but it is a big problem downwind from anywhere there's a big coal-fired power plant because coal-fired power plants give off sulfuric acid. The acid then gets into the atmosphere and rains down as rain or snow or fog. Um, and then it has a widespread effect on entire ecosystems, both aquatic and terrestrial. Um, what's wrong with basic water? You don't actually hear about that very often. I actually can't think of any, but I'm sure it can't be good when uh, the pH goes way outside of normal bounds. Notice how I skipped right over that. If you find out what's wrong with uh, uh, alkali water, high alkaline water, let me know. Um, just going to skip over here. this. Uh, caves are caused by the slow dissolving of carbonate by slightly acidic rainfall, and uh, it causes caves. And that carbonate goes somewhere. It goes into this water, and you can drink it. You can put it in your pipes, and then it can be a problem. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip over this stuff, but you can look at it. I just want to let you know we're also not covering a bunch of stuff here. We're not covering uh, persistent organic pollutants such as PCBs, DDT, plastics, and the like. We're not talking about pollution by heavy metals. We're not talking by pollution by sediments from erosion. These are very important forms of water pollution, but in this part of the class, I just wanted to focus on eutrophication because that's probably the most common and widespread form of water pollution, not to say that these aren't important as well. Um, okay, uh, that's it. Eutrophication, the equation of life on Earth, chemical macronutrients, the limiting law of limiting factors. Please try to understand all those. Um, uh, you need to understand that before, well, it's a good preparation for understanding the upcoming lecture, which is all about mass balance, which is a way to calculate mathematically the concentration of any pollutant in two streams when they mix. It's a very very rudimentary uh, form of measurement. Um, in real world, it gets much more complicated, but I wanted to give you the tools for at least uh, do simple calculations. So that will be in the next lecture. Okay, see you then. Bye-bye.